Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity's anniversary Sunday. It's a great day to be here and um, even greater that we survived vacation Bible school. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to ask the kids that are here this morning to come on up. So y'all come on up and we're going to sing a song that we learned at vacation Bible school. They did a great job. morning first thing in practice <laughs> only failed three times <laughs> for those of you who don't have a clue several weeks ago Sonny sang and he got up from over here wherever he was at and he, he ran up these steps and I said I'm gonna do that one day <laughs> and so I've been coming in practicing and uh, I just figured today's a good day probably the last time I ever do it <laughs> but, uh, but, but you were here, and, and when there's a 50th anniversary for Trinity, it'll say June the 24th, 2018, Brother Steve ran up the steps <laughs> in the sanctuary. <clears throat> June the 25th, 2018, Brother Steve passed away. <laughs> <laughs> no. Complications from running up the steps the previous day. Steve, you come. You be seated for a moment. I've asked a couple of guys to, to come and to, uh, to share a word of testimony. We're going to spread these out and uh, going to do one now. And uh, we, we don't have, or, uh, if, I'm not aware of it if we, if we do, we, we don't have a list of the actual charter members of the church. We have a list that was taken in, De in January of 1994. Uh, it, it says here on the, on the history highlights of the church that 103 people gathered on June the 23rd of 93, and we don't have a list of who those people were. 
uh, that I'm aware of. So, so we have a list from, uh, from uh, a few months later, and, uh, and I don't think either of the guys that are going to share testimony today were actually charter members. They came in a few weeks, a few months after the fact, and, uh, but they've been here a long time, and they're a blessing to me as I know that they are to you. So I've asked, I've asked Steve McComb to come and share. One page. <laughs> I had ten pages, but Kathy said, no way, we want to eat today. <laughs> Brother Steve said, make it short, so I'm going to take him at his word. Twenty-five years ago, it just seems like yesterday. Holiday Inn, Kurth Lake all the other places that uh, the church met as they were finding a location. Wow, again, just seems like yesterday. You know, and I, I'm just thankful that I've been a part of Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, where I have worshiped and served the Lord for the past 25 years. You know, the, the Lord has saved a great number of souls through our ministries here at Trinity. And I, personally, I'm just thankful to be part, just to be a small part of that. You know, also, I have been very fortunate in my life. I've been blessed in that I have a large family, a loving family, but you know, I've been just as blessed to have this church body, this church family, as part of my life over these past 25 years. You know, the church has always been here for me and for my family through the good times, through the times that maybe wasn't so good, but the church body has always been here just as my Lord has. And I'm so thankful for that. You know, there's been a lot of individuals who have influenced me in many ways, and I can't begin to name all of them. I wouldn't even try, but I will mention that we've had two pastors during this period of time, Brother Walter and Brother Steve, and we are so thankful for those men who have led our church and who have guided us. Uh, it's been a wonderful past 25 years that we are celebrating today. You know, but let's not forget about tomorrow, next year, or even the next 25 years. I think we need to begin today to focus on what we can do. And, you know, we all have a part. And we need to find that part because there is a part for each of us to play in this. And again, I am just so thankful that we can serve the Lord here at Trinity Baptist Church together. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Stand with us, please. Ushers, come this direction. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine.
Ron McMullen, would you come? I've asked Ron to come and share a word of testimony this morning as well. I just wondered, I was looking over this earliest list that we have of, of the uh, members back in January of 1994, and uh, as I scanned that list, I didn't, I don't know everybody, but I, I did notice this, that 25 years changes a lot of things. And, uh, you know, there, there probably aren't any of us that really look like we looked 25 years ago, even though we joke about it and we say that everybody else has changed, we, we, we all have. And uh, I noticed one thing that uh, on that list, there are a lot of those folks who have who've gone, on to, gone on to glory. And, uh, and, and so today we, we honor them. I'd intended to sing the old, the old song, Thank You, uh, for giving to the Lord, but some technical issue, uh, it's, it's not working back there, so we'll, we'll back up and punt here in just a few minutes. But, uh, but anyway, Brother Ron McMullen, he teaches the, the Jolly Senior class over here to my right, and uh, I've asked him to come and share. A little over 25 years ago, circumstances came up where a, a door was closed to the church we went to. Circumstances just were that we needed to walk out of that place. The door was closed. God closed it. We know that God will provide. When He closes one door, He opens another. Trinity Baptist was that open door. And here we are, and here we stay. Whenever I left, my wife, my sister-in-law, and both of my in-laws came with us. So it was, it was the five of us. We came to this church, didn't know what to think. We just didn't know. But God opened that door. We walked in. And we were met with the friendliest people you can imagine. There was just hands stretched out. We were hugged. We were blessed. It was wonderful to walk in and be accepted in that manner. And the church has not changed. It still accepts people just the same way. It turns out that my mother-in-law and dad-in-law joined the Jolly Seniors class. Well, Sandy and Sue being who they are, I want to go with Mama and Daddy. So we did. We joined the Jolly Seniors class. People kind of looked at us and thought, really? Well, that's okay. That's what we felt led to do. So we went to the Jolly Seniors class. And again, those people in that class they welcomed us in. They loved us. They took care of us. We were blessed. We had two teachers then, Dean Jones and Sherman Farr. And they taught lessons below. They swapped out with each other, just the two of them. Finally, it began to get the worst of them. So Sherman came to me and said, Ron, can you teach? And I said, Dean, I just need to pray about it. And I was hoping he'd forget. <laughs> he didn't forget and the Lord didn't either. So I became part of the teaching team. And that's been many years ago now. That has been the biggest blessing in my life. It has been wonderful to be with that group of people, have God's word there, and just the fellowship there. And I wish Sherman was here this morning to thank, but y'all can tell him, thank you, Sherman, for doing what you did. He allowed me to join in with he and Dean in the blessings of being a teacher. And I'm telling you that because if you've got teaching blood, use it. God needs you in there. And he knows what you can do. You can pray about it, just like I did but you're going to do it just like I did. Turns out that Sherman and Dean, as they got older, they were less able to, to teach. And so the load kind of went on me, and so did the blessings. 
It's just, it's, you can't really describe the blessings it is. Now, Dean and Sherman still bring us messages, thank goodness. So it's, it's really a good thing. The members of that class, they have been the most loving class. If you've never met some of the seniors that we have, you need to meet them because they are prayer warriors. And speaking of prayer warriors, I can't go by without talking about Kenneth Wilson and his praying. Y'all know Kenneth, the cowboy. He was one more praying fellow. And he taught me how to pray, how to love, and take care of people because that's what he did. Sunday school is very important. If you're not a member of Sunday school, shame on you. You're missing out on some blessings. Whether you want to go there as a teacher or go there as a class member, you're missing out on blessings if you don't do exactly that. You need to join a Sunday school class. That's part of the reason that this church has grown like it has because of Sunday school. Steve mentioned we've had several pastors. I can't, can't let you go by, Rick. We had Pastor Rick as an interim pastor when we were in the search mode. When we were looking for a pastor, God sent the man we needed. And pastor Rick, thank you for stepping up. Through all that we've been through, God has been the center of the attention. I was on the pastor search team, and I can tell you, it was hard work. And we, we got lots of sideways glances and grumbles and gripes. But I can assure you that what we were looking for as a pastor search team was God's man. It didn't make any difference what everybody else said or whatever. We were looking for the God man to be here. And we wanted God's blessing on this church with the pastor we were looking for. And we were blessed with that pastor. After all these years, we still have a loving church. We have a church that just is like no other church that I've ever been affiliated with, ever. It is a friendly church, and it's a church you need. If you're not a member already, you need to be a member. If you are a member and people don't know it, get out and show it. You just. We have a wonderful, wonderful church here. It is great. Trinity Baptist Church has blessed me and my family from the day we walked in all the way up to the very moment right now. It is a blessing to me. And I'm, I'm so glad that when we walked in that door almost 25 years ago, that we were accepted with all the love that's been given. And above all, God's Word has been taught from that day forward. God's Word. Not any man's opinion. God's Word. That is what we need. God is number one in our lives. God has the prior, He's got the priority place in this church. And He's blessing this church. I've been blessed, and I know you've been blessed. And thank you for your time today.
the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, Oh, what joy shall fill my heart when I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim been going through 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and we're there again today. We began two weeks ago, and this will be the midweek, mid, mid-series point, been talking about ministry. And two weeks ago, we, we were back in verse 1, and the Bible told us in verse 1 of this chapter, it says, therefore, since we have this ministry... And, and we didn't do anything to deserve this ministry. We have this ministry and we have this opportunity because of the grace and the mercy of God. Then last week we talked about what's supposed to be the center of this ministry. And Paul said in that fourth verse, no, in the fifth verse, he said, We do not preach ourselves, but... Jesus or Christ Jesus, the Lord, and, and then he went on to say, and we're just his servants. Now, we talked about how that's not, that doesn't really fly with our culture today because we don't want to be anybody's servants, but I'm telling you this morning, we are his servants. 
And that's all we'll ever be, are, are his servants. Now, today we come to this place, and if, and if we're not careful, and I know that you've heard this passage of Scripture before, and I'm sure that it's been preached from many different angles, and, and there's truth from every angle, I think, that, we could, that I could think of to preach it. But, but Paul begins to talk about, and, and we've been going through Wednesday night through the book of Acts, and we've seen where he stopped and wrote various letters to various people in various churches at various times. And, and here in this particular letter, it's a second letter to the church at Corinth. If we're not careful, we would just, we would just catch the negatives because we, we seem to be able to uh, identify with difficulties and hard times. And, and he goes through and he, and he mentions several. And, and, and there's no need for us to play like they don't exist because we know that difficulties do exist. Hard times exist. Difficult times and circumstances and issues and, and all of those things, they're all a part of life. But, but, but as I read this and I study this, Paul doesn't want us to be caught up with the, with the negative side of the things that he talks about, but with the confidence. You see, difficulties, if we've lived long enough, and we don't have to live long, before we realize that difficulties are just a part of life. You know, we, at some point in our life, we kind of are at this, this short stage of our life where we just think that everybody lives happily ever after, as the old fairy tales would say. Well, well, we come to find out that, you know, we, we, we see couples. In fact, anybody in, how many of you have been married over 50 years? Just raise your hand. There are several hands across. 60. How many of you have hit 60 already? Anybody 65? Well, maybe that was our line. I, I, see, I see Dean and Faye back there. Dean so wore out he can't even lift his hand, but bless Faye's heart, she is lifting hers. You know, we... we, we Somebody else? Miss Nelda, how long y'all been? 66. What have y'all been, Faye and Dean? 67. Hang in there, Faye. You'll catch them one day. We, 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 we sit there and we, we look at that and we see somebody's been married this length of time. And, and just looking from the outside in, we would think, man, that's a, that must have been easy. But we, but we know that, you know, Don and I have been married 34, and, and, and I've been on the church staff for about 32 or 33 of those 34 years, and, and even with that being so, everything's not always easy. And, and I'll assure you that for those who, who made over 60 and 65 and those who are over 50, it, it hadn't always been easy, and, and nor will it ever be. Well, 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 church is much the same way. Ministry's the same way. You see, there's, I, I think there are people in our culture today that they think, well, you know, they're just, a, they're, they're just a group of people that meet at a particular place, at a geographic location, and, and they don't have these things. Well, I, I'm telling you, I am thankful for the truth of the Word of God. And the truth of the Word of God tells us that this, this deal that we've, been, we've received by grace, this ministry, it's not always easy. Just like a marriage has to go through some difficult times and difficult circumstances, so does ministry. But, but our deal is, is we don't just focus on the, the circumstances and, and, and the trying times. Is, is today what I want us to see are, is where does our confidence come from? Where does our confidence come from? We're just going to read these two verses. It's verse 8 and 9. And, and, and the words, that, depending on your translation, they may vary a little bit. But, but, but the word that I will use is, is a meaning of whatever word appears there. But here's what Paul says in the 8th verse. He says, we are troubled or hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Now, now, now let, me, let me give you this, and I, I know that we're, we're headed for lunch here in a few minutes, and, and I don't want to keep you from that, but, but I, I want to share this with you. I want to I quickly go through these first two things. And, and, and just, just to show you something. First of all, is, is talking about where's our confidence come from. Paul, first of all, talks about the existence of difficulty. 
And he does that in the very first three words, four words, however your translation may go. But it's, it's the words, we are troubled, we are hard-pressed. That, that, that word, is, it's a meaning of difficulty. There's difficulty in life, amen? There's difficulty in marriage. There's difficulties in raising a family. There's difficulties in ministry. And, and, and listen, Paul had made the decision. In Acts chapter 9, Paul, he, he has his salvation experience on the Damascus Road, and he has a salvation experience. He has given his life. He has given his time. He has given just about every fiber of his being. He has given that to the Lord, and he sought to magnify Christ, and he sought to promote Christ and present Christ at every opportunity that he was given. But even so, he still continued to face troubles and tribulation. You see, being placed in the body of Christ. Now, now Paul, we all know where he came from. He was a persecutor of the Christians. He set out that morning going down the Damascus Road, and he, he was not in search of Christ. He was in search of Christians, and he wasn't in search of them to fellowship with them. He was, in, he was in search of them to try to do away with them, at the very least to throw them in trouble. But now he's, now he's been saved. He's given his life to Christ. He is within the body of Christ. But being in the body of Christ, this did not remove difficulty from his life. In, in, in fact, what we find out, his commitment, his commitment to Christ, his commitment to serve him, his commitment to witness for him, his commitment to win folks to Christ, if anything, it increased the difficulty. And, and, and that's what Paul talks about here. He's talking about that even though I have done those things in my life, Paul says, he says, he says I am still hard-pressed, I'm troubled. As children of God, as Christians in 2018, when we give our life to Christ and we commit ourselves to him and we sell out to live for him day in and day out at work, at school, and all the places that we are, I'm, I'm just telling you this morning, I, I wish I could tell you that everything will be hunky-dory from this day forward and there would never be any problems from this day forward and there'll never be any bumps in the road there'll never be any of those things but I'm telling you according to the word of God it says we're troubled we're troubled well he, he not only talks about the fact that we're troubled he talks about this is number two the extent of that difficulty he follows that statement or we're, that we're hard pressed or troubled with these three words on every side. Now, let, let me tell you what Paul is not referring to. Paul is not referring to a small skirmish. He's not necessarily speaking about some small little bitty bump in the road, speed bump that we would find on the, on the parking lot of a, uh, of, a, of, of a business somewhere in town. He's not talking about a small skirmish. He, he is making a declaration. We know that the Bible's full of declarations. He loves us. He's coming again. All of those things are declarations. Well, Paul is making a declaration for those who serve the Lord. And the declaration is not only that we're going to be troubled or hard-pressed, but catch this. Where's it going to come from? Paul said it's going to come from every side. Here's what that means. That means that trouble is probably going to come from places that you would suspect it to come from. Places that, and from people that will not surprise you. But you know what else Paul is saying? You say, Brother Steve, this is not much of an anniversary message. This is not much of a fire me up and get me out there. I'm just telling you, this is the truth. And I'm going to throw this out there at you. I've shared this with a number of people in the past few months or weeks. And, and, and I say this from the, from the position of a pastor, that ministry, Brother Rick, you correct me if I'm wrong, ministry is harder today than it has been in the 35 years that I've been in ministry. People are more difficult. 
It, it's harder to reach people. It's harder to do ministry. Our culture is, we, we, we lived in a culture uh, uh, back in the, I don't know when it would have begun, a long time ago, probably prior to my birth in the early 60s. But, but up, until, up until kind of this juncture of time, our, our nation has been pretty open to the gospel and the teaching thereof. And, and, and you, can, you can turn on your television or you can listen to the news and, and you find that our culture as a whole, even within this area that we live referred to as the Bible Belt, our culture is becoming more and more closed and anti the things of the Word of God. There was a time when we could come into the house of God and, and there wouldn't be difficulties. But when, but when Paul makes this statement that we're troubled and it's going to come from every side, it will come from without, but sometimes it will come from within. And it will come from places that we never expected. Now, now, we all know, if you've been with us on Wednesday, we've walked with Paul throughout the three missionary journeys, and, and, he, and he made it to Rome the other night, and he, he spends some time there before he's killed. And so we know, and we've sort of followed him as he, as he makes all these journeys and all these different places that he, that he went to and churches that he established and letters that he wrote back to these churches, and, and now they're a part of the council of the Word of God. And, and, and Paul, is, Paul is letting us know, hey, sometimes different Difficulty will come from the outside in places that you certainly expect it, but sometimes it's going to come from where you least expect it. Listen to me. That's why our confidence cannot be in each other. If our confidence is, if our confidence is in one another, we're doomed for failure. But I'm telling you this morning, Paul's confidence was not in any of the people. You, you, you remember throughout Paul's ministry, there were people that would stay with him for a while and they would walk with him, they would travel with him, they would teach with him, they would, they would help him do all sorts of things. And then somewhere later on, he would write in a letter, he would say, so-and-so. I, I won't go through and call all the names. He says, so-and-so has forsaken me, has left me. So-and-so is no longer with me. You see, if our confidence, now listen, I, I want you to have confidence in me, but I can't be all of your confidence. You see, our confidence must be in Jesus Christ. Because I'm telling you, according to the authority of the Word of God, the Word of God says that He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. Steve Cowart will not be the same. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. Stick your name in there and the same can be said. You will not be the same. So, so our confidence cannot be totally in one another, but this morning our confidence must be in Jesus Christ because all of these difficulties, they're going to come from literally everywhere. And it's, it's those times that it puts us in the place in our life. Have, have you ever been to that place, whether it be in business or home, where you just sat there and you thought, and you say, well, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go next. I don't know what direction to. And, and that's what happens with the extent of this thing, of this difficulty, because it's going to come from every side. Then in the latter part of the eighth verse, Paul begins to, to, to give an expression of this difficulty. He does so with three P words. It's the words perplexed, persecuted, and pressured. Let, let's look at the word perplexed. He makes this statement. He's going to name some specific troubles that he and all of those who serve Christ will encounter. He says, we are perplexed. We are perplexed. Now, this word perplexed, it speaks of the following, being without resources, to be left wanting, to be embarrassed, to not know which way to turn or what to do, to hesitate, or to be in doubt. Now, here's what Paul is making an admission to. Now, Paul, the great missionary, the great preacher, the great soul winner, the great church planter, the great, all of these things that we see throughout the course of his life, he is making an admission, and here's the admission. He says, there have been times, both 
in my life and in my ministry that Paul said, I was perplexed. I was, I was perplexed. I was without resources. I was, I was left wanting. I didn't know which way to turn. I didn't know what to do. There were times, Paul said, when I hesitated. There were, there were times when, 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 when I was in doubt about things. And, and listen, he honestly, it, this is hard for us to, to picture a Paul as, as, as the great preacher and soul winner and missionary, but there are times in his life where the apostle Paul did not know what to do. Kind of puts us in good company, doesn't it? Paul just didn't know what to do sometimes. There were times when this giant of the faith was hesitant. There were times when, when he was facing uncertainty. There were times when, when, when doubt began to creep, to creep into his life. And, and listen, I, I think we would all be in agreement this morning that we live in perplexing days. There are things going on in our culture, and, and we, we used to talk about if grandma or grandpa could come back from the grave, they, they wouldn't know what, they would, they would roll over in their graves, kind of the old saying, if they seen the things that were going on. We're seeing things go on in the United States of America that not many years ago we would have thought those things would never happen, and now they're happening. And they're not just happening in the, in the back rooms of, in hidden places. Now they're, now they're out there to be flaunted and thrown out there. They, they bombard the television, main, main tele, prime time television time. It, it, some of you remember when the movie, well, I can't even call the name of it, but watch his name said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a doggone. You remember that? And can you run? I just remember reading about this when Elvis Presley went on the Ed Sullivan show and he twisted. And, and from what I read, I mean, people thought that because of that event by Elvis Presley that America was going to hell in a handbasket. And now if we could see Elvis Presley twisting on the Ed Sullivan show, it would be Walt Disney television. Now every lifestyle that there is is flaunted and it's thrown around us. And I'm, I, I tell you those things to tell you this. We live in perplexing days. And, and listen to me this morning. I wish I could tell you this wasn't so. This is not only true outside in our culture. It has crept into the church. And, and a lot of these lifestyles have been have been. Uh, given a place with the church. Listen, I, I'm telling you, this is what I think the Bible teaches us. God, he loves everybody. It doesn't matter their color, their culture. It doesn't, I don't think any of those things matter. But I'm telling you what my Bible does say. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. He hates sin. And I'm telling you, that's the sin in Steve Coward's life. That's the sin in Eddie Brown's life. That's the sin in Ryan Hassel's life. And that's the sin in your life. I'm telling you this morning that we live in perplexing days. Values and ideas and morals that have stood the test of time in our nation, they are literally crumbling around us. And, 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 they're, and they're going away. And, and it leaves us in that place to ask, well, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? He said, we're perplexed. Then he, then he goes on to say in the beginning of that ninth verse, he used the word persecuted. And that word persecuted means this, being made to run or put to flight, to pursue in a hostile manner, to harass, to mistreat, or to persecute. Now, Paul, he faced his share of persecution, especially in regard to his faith in Christ. And, and, and we've seen as we followed him through the, through the book of Acts from, from his salvation experience, he had been forced to flee many places. He had been forced to leave many times. His life had been threatened. He was faced, there were numbers of times when he faced imminent threats and danger. He was harassed. He was mistreated. He was stoned. He was left for dead. And, and, and listen, all of this happened because he was committed 
to sharing the Word of God with people everywhere. That's why it happened. And I'm going to tell you, it's still the same today. It doesn't matter if we speak of a person or if we speak of a corporate group as a church. If we toe the line, so to speak, And we just make the declaration that we're going to stand according to what this book says. And everything that this book says, you don't have to like it. But it's not going to change what it says. And here's what's going to happen, brethren. As we make the decision that we're going to toe the line and we're going to do these things because, and we're going to teach these things because this is what the Word of God teaches us, the more that we do that, especially in the culture that we live in today, we are going to face these things that Paul talks about or he refers to when he uses the word persecuted. The church, we see it almost daily today. The church is harassed. The church is mistreated. The church is persecuted. The church is, has, has pretty well been uh, put, uh, put to flight. The church is being uh, pursued in a hostile manner. All the things that that little word talks about that Paul used there, that, that's what happens. You see, most of us, if you're kind of my age or, 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 or above, we, we've kind of, we don't know much about persecution. But I believe we're at a time in a, in a state in our culture where that's all changing. And the more we stand for the things of the Word of God, the more hostility that there's going to be. The more we stand for thus saith the Word of God, I believe that we are increasingly And you see these things happening. We're more increasingly viewed in a negative light by politicians, by newscasters, and and, and all of those things. Those who choose to stand for the Lord will face increased persecution. Well, he uses another P word, perplexed, persecuted, and pressured. Now, this word pressured All it means is to be thrown to the ground. How many of you ever got thrown down? I've been thrown down. I remember one time in Woodshop, Lufkin High School. I was a sophomore. There were only three grades on the high school campus at that time, and the high school wasn't right there. But Lufkin High School up on Denman Avenue, we was in Woodshop one day, and I thought I was somebody, but I wasn't. But anyway, we were in Woodshop, and there was a gentleman I won't call his name because some of you I know some of you know him I'll tell you later but anyway I'll call him I'll call him Bill that's not his name but anyway Bill was coming this way and I was going this way and we were just walking along and I wasn't going to move and he wasn't either so when we passed we were near enough to the middle of that aisle that we were walking down that our shoulders you know how you just bump shoulders with somebody well that's that's what happened well, I kind of glanced back after we rubbed shoulders. Well, we were in wood shop, and there's this, there's this big old box. It's about yay wide and about yay tall, and, and it was full of wood cutoffs, stuff that had been cut off that you could reuse pieces off of it. And by the time I glanced around, all I seen was a chunk of that wood in Bill's hand, And that chunk of wood was on its way at a downward arc coming down along about the side of my head. And I'm going to tell you, if I had it to do over again, I would not bump shoulders with Bill. Because Bill knocked me to the ground. Well, that's what Paul is talking about right here. He is talking about, when he says to be struck down, he is talking about being thrown to the ground. Now, now Paul, I don't guess he ever took wood shop, and I don't imagine that fellow named Bill ever hit him over the head with a, with a chunk of wood out of, the, out of the wood shop scrap box. But Paul knew what it was to be thrown down, and so did all of the people to whom he was writing. Because if you remember, most of these people, they knew what it was like when they would go to some of the coliseums of the day, and they would go to those places, and the gladiators, they would get in that coliseum, and they would fight one another, and they wouldn't just fight a three-minute round. They would fight till one could not get up and fight anymore. 
They called it fighting to the death. Well, when Paul uses this phrase, to be thrown to the ground, the people to whom he was writing, they understood. They knew what Paul was talking about when he said, when he spoke about being cast down. Now, Paul was cast down. Paul was cast down physically, but he was also, and this happens when we commit our life to Christ and we serve him and we commit to tell other people, there are going to be times when we not only have physical scars, but if you've been committed long, you've got some spiritual scars. And we will be thrown down not only physically, we will be thrown down spiritually. And, 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 and that's what Paul speaks of here. Now, 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 this is all too familiar to those who, who take a stand and, 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 and try to live for the Lord and try to serve the Lord and try to put him first in our life. I, I, I wish I could tell you these things weren't going to happen, but according to the word of God, we're going to be struck down. Now listen, there, that is no great bad thing to be struck down. The bad thing is not to get back up. I'll tell you what's happened to a lot of church people over the years. They've been struck down. And they hadn't gotten back up. That's a tragedy for the church. Our feelings get hurt. We get aggravated. We get mad, we get hurt, we get all of these different things that happen to us. But I'm telling you, according to the Word of God, the Word of God says that's just part of it. It's going to happen. I'm running through my mind right now is that commercial on TV. How many of you are thinking of the same commercial? Help, I've fallen, and I can't get up. It's not that we can't get up, it's that we don't get up. Bless God, the Bible teaches us and shows us and reminds us time and time again that we're going to go through time when we're perplexed. We're going to go through times when we're persecuted. We're going to go through times when we're struck down. But when that happens, bless God, get up! Get up and move forward. Well, let me finish with Roman numeral number four. We have the existence, those tough times are coming, we're hard pressed, the extent they come from every side, the expression we're perplexed, we're persecuted and we're pressured, and here's the endurance. Here, here's that thing about get up. He, Paul, Paul begins to give us some things that we are, that we're not. We are perplexed, we are troubled, we, we have difficulties, but listen, we are never defeated if our confidence is in him. We are never defeated if our confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he goes through and he gives us a list of four things. They're D words that we are not. Even though we're troubled, even though we're perplexed, we're persecuted, we're pressured, and all of those things come, he tells us four things that we're not. And, and, and they're, not, they're not so for us. So, so let's look at those four things. The first one is, he says, he says we're not distressed. Now to get that one, we've, we've got to go back to the beginning of verse 8 where it says we're, we're troubled on every side, but we're not crushed or distressed. We are not crushed or distressed. Now this word distressed, it has the idea of being confined in a narrow, tight place with no way out. Crushed compressed, cramped, distressed, or anguished. Now, Paul, Paul had faced some tight places in his life. Paul had been through some times in his life and different seasons in his life where it seemed that there was no way of escape. If, if, if the gospel, if, 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 if the acts of the apostles were a television show broken up in 30-minute intervals, there would be some weeks that we would be watching that show and we come down to the end of that 30-minute episode, we would spend the next week, well, I wonder if Paul got out of that mess or not. Well, he did. He got out. And, and, and I'm telling you, it's because we, we don't get in a place where there is no way of escape. 
because he is our way of escape. Listen, Paul had faced intense pressure, but he was never fully crushed by the people that put the pressure on him, nor was he crushed by the burden of the circumstance that that he was in. And sometimes we will find ourselves in those tight places. Sometimes we will find ourselves in those difficult times in our life and uncomfortable situations, but we must maintain our faith. And our faith must be in him. I won't stand here and tell you tough times won't come. And I won't tell you that things that you don't understand won't happen. But I will tell you this. That the doctor could walk in today and he could give the, 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 the announcement that you have the disease. And it could be that bad A word, Alzheimer's. It could be that bad C word. It could be cancer. But I'm telling you, Alzheimer has no hold on Steve Coward. Cancer has no hold on Steve Coward. Circumstance has no hold on Steve Coward. Trials and tribulations don't have a hold on Steve Coward because Steve Coward's confidence is not in any of those things. It's not in any of these people. His confidence is in Jesus Christ. And my Bible teaches me that Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. So even though those times come, I'm not distressed. I'm not crushed. Then then, then he uses the word perplexed or despondent. I mean, despair or despondent. Now now that word, what it really means is, is the word despair is the idea of being totally at a loss, without hope and void of any resources. So as we think back over the life of Paul, we, we must realize that there were many times, not just a few, but there were many times when Paul was perplexed. He was, he was at that time in our life when, and I know that you've used this word, yeah, wit's end. You, you know that little phrase? I don't know exactly where wit's end is, but I think I've been there a few times. I know my mama's been there because she told me face to face, son, you have driven me to my wit's end. Now, I don't know where wit's end was located, but I took her there several times throughout the course of my life. Well, well, well Paul talks about this, this idea. He, he said he, he, he was perplexed. He was at his wit's end. But bless God, he knew one who was greater than himself. And after that salvation experience on the Damascus Road, And when Paul, he he not only trusted Christ to be his Savior, but through the process of time, Jesus was not only Paul's Savior, but he went through the process of becoming Paul's Lord. And through that process, we we might refer to it as discipleship or, or whatever it is, maybe even maturity. Through that process of time, Paul learned to trust in God regardless of what the circumstance may be. Oh, that we could learn that. Oh, that we could learn that. You know, if if we could look down in the proverbial crystal ball and we could see the events that may be ahead of us and and we could know what's happening out there, then then, then we we would see the necessity of having a great faith and a great God. Some of you could stand this morning and give testimony to the things that have occurred in your life, some over the past few weeks, some over the past months, and some over the past years of things that you never really anticipated happening. And you could stand up and give testimony that you would not have made it through were it not for him. I'm telling you this morning, we don't know what's ahead. We don't know what's down the road. We don't know what's in the next hour. But I'm telling you, whatever it is, be it good or be it bad, be it a good circumstance, be it a difficult circumstance, be it a perplexing time, a persecuted time, or a pressured time, we need to have a great faith and a great God. We need to learn how to trust God in the good times so that we'll trust Him when the things are not so good. Some of you could stand this morning and give testimony that it's your trust and faith in God right now that, are, that is seeing you 
through the things that you may be going through and experiencing in life. And you could stand and give testimony to those who may not be in a time such as that, that that they need to have a great faith and a great God because those things are coming. See, he says we're we're not despondent. We, We don't despair. We don't do that. Then he said, then he said, we're not forsaken. That, that word is deserted. Paul, he, he faces a lot of harassment. He faces ridicule from his peers. He, 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 even being forsaken by, and I mentioned this earlier, he's forsaken by people that he trusts. He had placed confidence in some people, and they had forsaken him. But I'm telling you this morning, there is one who will not forsake you. And that's not the person you're married to. It's not the person that you might have given birth to. But the Word of God tells us this, for those of us who have been saved, that He will never leave you, nor will He forsake you. It doesn't matter if we're on the mountaintop of the mountaintop. Or if we are in the depths of the valley of the shadow of death, he will not leave us. He will not not forsake us. So even though we go through these times of difficulty, even though we face these hardships, even though we face all of these things, if you are born again, if you are a child of God, if you have been saved by the grace of God, you will never be deserted. Oh, it's great to have Christian brethren and friends because when you're going through those times, they sure, are, they sure do minister to us, don't they? But I'm telling you, there could come a time when all of those may forsake you. But I'll assure you of this this morning. He won't. He will never, ever forsake you. So he says, he says we're, we're not distressed even though all those things happen. We're not despondent. We're not deserted. And and the last thing that he says about this, he says we're not destroyed. We are cast down. That's the one he uses this far. We we are cast down. So he's, he's, he's he's giving the acknowledgement that he has been cast down many times, but not destroyed. He, when he's thrown down to the ground, it's not for him to stay there. His, his enemies might have prevailed briefly. His enemies might have prevailed momentarily, but the Lord preserved Paul. And we know that Paul eventually, we, we don't get this in Scripture, we just read this from history and the things that we know about history written in other places, that Paul comes to the place, it's two years from where we were at Wednesday night in our Bible study, and two years later, history tells us that Paul was beheaded. He was beheaded for his faith in Christ, but even in death, he was not destroyed. Even in death, he was not destroyed. The hands of evil men took the life of the apostle Paul. But bless God, he was not only saved, he was not only a member of the church such as we are, but he was eternally secure in Christ. And I'm telling you this morning that this culture can do whatever she wants to do. This culture can claim all that she wants to claim. But if you're a born-again child of God, you have victory even after this life. So even when Steve Cowart's ticker quits ticking, and even when his beater in there stops beating, I am not destroyed because I'm eternally secure in Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is why our confidence has to be in Him. Because He's not only the one who keeps us going now. He is the one who provides us life for all eternity. And it's because of Him and His precious gift to us that we won't be destroyed. We can get up. And while we're still here in this world, I, 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 seen, a, I seen a deal in one of those pictures. I seen the picture pass, pass by on the screen earlier in the church video. And, and it was a sign. It, it used to be up there kind of at, uh, at Denman and 
Chestnut, I think, is where the sign was. And maybe in the wrong place, but but it was it was congratulations, Trinity Baptist Church, on your first Sunday in this building. And I think that sign said, if I remember correctly, it said 441 people heard the gospel that day. Now you look around you today, and it it doesn't take rocket science. There's not 441 of us in here. And we can do one of two things. We can say, well, things not like they used to be. Or we can say, it may not be 441 today, but bless God, we may have been knocked down. We may have been perplexed. We may have been pressured. But bless God, we're going to get up. And we're going to continue on. And we're going to continue on till Jesus comes again. And we're going to keep preaching the truth. And we're going to keep preaching the gospel. And we're not going to water it down. And we're not going to make it milk toast. We're going to preach the unadulterated truth of the Word of God. And we're going to ask God to bless it. And even though when times come when we may get thrown down, we're going to get back up. And even though we may be what the world might, we might come to a place in our life where we might, the word destroyed could be used. We know that we'll never be destroyed because, because we are who we are because of him. And he is eternal. So he can't be destroyed and neither will we. And bless God, we're going to keep on keeping on. So when you ever read these two verses of Scripture again, and you, or, or even if you ever just hear them read or referred to, don't view them in the form of the negative. View them in confidence. Because we all old enough to know that trouble sometimes come. But he was an overcomer. And if our faith and if our trust is in him, we too are overcomers because of him. I pray today that the confidence of Trinity Baptist Church as a corporate group of people, a corporate body, I pray that our confidence, I pray that the confidence of Trinity Baptist Church was never in a man by the name of Walter Fudge. Nor I also pray that it was never in the man of Brother Rick Williams. And I want you to know that it doesn't need to be in the person of Steve Coward. I pray that our confidence, our faith, our trust, and our hope. Today we give thanks for the past 25. But we look forward with great hope and trust for what he will do in the next 25. And I pray this morning that you will commit to allowing him to use you to accomplish whatever it is that he has to accomplish in the ministry of this church in those years. I pray that your confidence, your hope is in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for so many things today. Thank you for the past history of this church body. Thank you for those who came and, and led the way and, 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 and went through all of the things that had, that had to be gone through and the ministry that had to be done to bring us to where we are today. And Lord, we realize that from this point forward, it's not all about those who led through the first 25, but it's, it's us. Lord, you tell us in your word that the steps of a good man, a godly man, they're ordered by the Lord. And Lord, you have brought us. You have brought this staff. You have brought this membership. You have brought these people to this place in time, to this juncture of time when, when we enter a new 25 years of ministry. And Lord, I would today that that you would speak to each and every heart in this room today. And I pray today that, that it can't just be my words because they will soon be forgotten. But I pray this morning that through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, 
that you would remind us that we have a place in this ministry of this church to do your work, to do your will, and to carry on in your way and to do ministry for the years that are, that are ahead of us just as those who have come behind us have done in our past. God, I pray this morning that we realize that difficult times, they're not coming, they're upon us. And Lord, that we're more, maybe more so than ever, our faith and our trust and our confidence must be in you. Help us this morning to get our eyes off of one another and to cast our eyes upon you and not just see you, but follow you and trust you and walk with you and do your will for the ministry of Trinity Baptist Church in the days to come. Save the soul who's nearest hell this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would add to this church family those who you may have to be a part of this ministry in this place. Use this time to further the kingdom of an almighty God. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.